Welcome to episode 174 of Sports Geek. On this week's episode, I chat AFL audiences and growth with Darren Birch. Welcome to Sports Geek, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host who loves buying podcast listeners a beer, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. And yes, my name is Sean Callanan, and I do love buying a beer for podcast listeners. So if you are a listener and uh, we meet in real life, please remind me of that. I'm more than happy to. You are listening to Sports Geek. You are hopefully doing it on your favourite podcast platform um, and uh, really appreciative of all the people that have left reviews so far. Uh, you can contact me either by uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Instagram, at Sean Callanan on most platforms, uh, or you can contact me the old-fashioned way, uh, Sean at sportsgeekhq.com. Uh, as I said before, love catching up and hearing from listeners. Uh, this week's uh, podcast, I caught up with uh, Darren Birch uh, from the AFL, uh, the Australian Football League, to discuss his both career in, in the football industry and also some of the uh, some of the plans going forward for the AFL in attracting new fans and uh, growing an audience for a, a well-established brand and a well-established uh, uh, sport, uh, recognising that uh, they've got to reach into new markets and be ever appealing uh, to new fans. Uh, to, and especially we talk a lot about uh, the 5 to 12-year-olds and what they're potentially going to be doing in 20 years time and trying to future-proof sport so i hope you enjoy this chat with darren birch from the afl very happy to be here at afl house uh the headquarters for the australian football league welcome to the podcast darren birch Thanks, Sean. Great to be here. I uh, was going to uh, introduce you through your title, but it's one of those long titles that I think you even even needed to get an extension to the business card. What is your title now? Yeah, right now, the my title has changed a few times, but it's now the General Manager of Growth, Digital and Audience, which um, really indicates, I guess, where we're going as a business, to be honest. And so, yeah, so what's... So what was the role before that? And again, you know, uh, what was the genesis of that role? Yeah, look, I've been at the AFL. This is my 13th year. Um, I started here in the commercial team as the membership and ticketing manager. So um, been on the commercial side of the business for a long period of time. Before that, I was in a club for five years. I was with the Brisbane Lions and uh, worked in a commercial role there. And when I came to the I came to the AFL in two thousand and five, um, and over the journey, just as people sort of left or changed their roles in the business, I picked up more parts of the commercial part of the business, primarily on the consumer side first, so in membership, ticketing, licensing, and then in two thousand and ten, um, I got the opportunity. Fortunately, it's backed in by Andrew and Gill to take over Gill's old role of general manager of commercial operations, which was really all of the non-broadcast revenues of the AFL. Um, and that's that was everything on the consumer side of the business, membership, ticketing, licensing, and then in the corporate side of the business, sponsorships, partnerships, corporate hospitality, events, uh, and eventually digital sales. So uh, that was an interesting journey then. Marketing got thrown in there, I think, because I was complaining about marketing, so ended up with it. Um, and, and this I, is at the same time when uh, AFL Media was born, and you, you know you've you've scaled up from you know a, a small staff that's supporting AFL.com.au to to a large media staff uh, as well. Yeah, sure. In parallel, um, we had great broadcast outcomes um, with free-to-air and and pay television and then our relationship with Telstra uh, was very strong. So we acquired a number of businesses that were already doing or playing in the media space and it became AFL Media. Um, and at the same time, we were shifting our business internally. So marketing and brand came within the commercial team uh, and that 
was going along really well and we were able to get good growth in both parts of the business. Uh, and then as business changed and the new broadcast cycle came around and then we've had other other executive team members leave. So we've reshaped the business again uh, in the last uh, probably three times since Skills um, become the CEO. And now we've realigned our business uh, with AFL media, digital, um, all of the technology, uh, product development, audience segmentation, marketing and brand becoming one team yep. under the growth digital and audience. And we've split out the commercial part of the team again, sort of roll back to like 2013 because it's such an important part of the business now to have a discrete commercial business. And we've gone after a, a really talented person in Kylie Rogers uh, who will join us. She's currently finishing her role as the CEO of Mamma Mia. But we primarily went after Kylie. You know, we really um, wanted somebody that could help us in the digital commercialization space. Yep. And understanding the whole structure of on network, off network, ability to use data to monetize. What we have is as a big publishing business with afl.com.au. So my role is to continue to grow that part of the business from a content perspective, um, traffic, et cetera, and Kylie's role in conjunction will be to monetize that in a different way to what we've been doing currently. So that's sort of the evolution over a yep. long period of time. But the business always changes and it's been a really dynamic environment to be in. You know, you sort of get thrown different things. It's it's a bit like Toyota, you know, they pick you up and drop you in another part of the business that you know nothing about. And I never claimed to be a marketer and I've never worked in media, but in this organisation you get fantastic opportunities to learn new things. So it's pretty exciting. I mean, for mine, and I was mocking the title because it was long, but I mean, that that three prong is is really important, you know, starting with that data piece of understanding the fan and understanding what they're doing. And that's something the AFL's, you know, put a lot of study into to understand where they're going. But then you've got the other part of growth. You can't, you can't just stagnate and just be talking to the same people all the time. And so how do you, how do you balance those, those, those two parts of the equation? It's going to be a really interesting challenge. I, I don't think sport does that, does this very well. In this country, I think there are great examples of uh, sporting organisations being more data driven in the US, and the Golden State Warriors are probably the one of the standouts in in utilising data to drive insight to then create the right product set for the right audience segment to drive the best monetization option. If you look at our partners that we work with. Um, and look, I'll use Crownbet as a good example of an organisation who is a digital organisation that understands its customer segment extraordinarily well and leverages that data to drive a monetary outcome. Uh, we're learning a lot from them, but we have to pivot our business. We, we've got 4 million unique people come to our website every month, yep. but they're probably avid fans yep. and they're people who are highly invested in the sport, highly passionate, want the right information. Um, but if we're going to survive it as a sport, we can, we need to continue to grow our audience set, particularly in um, the areas of women and AFLW has been an unbelievably good lesson for us in terms of the potential audience growth that you can get from diversification. Yep. Uh, we need to be focusing more in the 5 to 12-year-old space. Um, if you think about a 5-year-old child today, at the end of this broadcast cycle they will be 12. What do we have on offer for a digital native at, the tw at 12 years of age that puts our sport as a consideration for consumption in their world. So if you look at five to 12-year-olds, we're running off a model of play, go, live and learn. Yep. 
So play the sport, go to the sport, live, which is the digital environment, and then learn being around school and curriculum. We've got a lot of work to do in that space on a national basis to make our game relevant in 2030, which is a child born today in 2030 will be 12 or 13 years of age. Yep. We are playing catch up in this space, to be honest. Um, Auskick was a was a great program and still is a great program, but a lot of other sports gone past us. Um, you know, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And, yep, it um, is. But I think some of the other sports have are doing much better in this space than us, and we've got a we've got a lift. Um, and and particularly in, you know, I keep saying to people, we're a content business, yep. um, and that content needs to be insightfully constructed um, and then it has to be delivered in the right channel to the right segment and that provides opportunity uh, to monetize. So it's a pretty, you know, it sounds simple, but it's bloody hard to do in the sporting environment and to pivot your business and to invest um, and take risks in this space is is the really exciting challenge. I mean, yeah, you talk there about, you know, different products and, you know, the AFLW being introduced um, opens up the new audiences, um, but also different, you know, different content products that, that fit for those uh, those different markets and it's it's off the traditional path and, you know, AFL and footy in general and we're in a mad footy town here in Melbourne that there's a lot of focus on, the product on the field and getting that right and there's a lot of focus there but you've like you said you've got to be 10 15 years out looking at what are we producing and a lot of that's also happening out of this market this is a very mature market they they get footy but AFL's you know new frontier is still what's happening in New South Wales and what's happening in in Queensland so you've got to have that focus you know you've got to pull yourself out of the back page of the paper and the day to day issues that that swamp footy and keep keep it keep an eye on that that long term view with these kind of plans. Yeah, well, uh, that's really, you know, if you look at the title, growth, digital, and audience. If we want to grow, we have to be relevant to women. We have to be relevant to five to twelve year olds. And the other area that we need to be relevant is is geographically, which yep. is the northern markets, which happen to be the biggest population, and the biggest television audiences, and the biggest commercial audiences. Uh, and at the moment, we are still, you know, in in some of those areas and some of those regions in those northern markets, we're not in the consideration set as um, a sport that people will either consider watching, following or playing. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do there. We think that focusing our efforts in the 5 to 12-year-olds and particularly within curriculum is a big opportunity for us. Um, you know, you can't rely in – in our traditional markets, we rely upon mums and dads yep. and advocates of the game to promote the game. Yeah, I call it – I call it uh, in Melbourne it's guilt-level marketing. Yeah, You know, correct. you meet another yeah. fan and, and they'll go, hang on, you're not a member yet. Yeah, and I, I think um, – you know, the biggest pockets of our traditional markets that lack growth in football is where there are not white guys. Yep. So we actually have to be cognizant that our population is changing and that we have a broader uh, ethnic um, community. And if you're not – if you're an immigrant to Australia and you were never brought up on – uh, watching AFL football, but you grew up playing soccer or rugby union or another sport, what relevance does AFL football have to you and to your children? Because that's just not that's just not in their thinking. Yep. Uh, and we have to recognise that. And if we're going to be relevant to those kids, um, we can't rely upon their parents is what we've traditionally done to advocate for the game. Um, you know, people say to me, you know, we, if we sort of diverge into esports, people say to me, oh, I don't get this. It's yep. crazy. It's like how can anyone watch um, 
Who you gamers, know, who but gamers, on, on and how does anyone what's digital? You know, people on Twitter. I said, well, there's no different to someone from, uh, you know. Uh, um, it's, yeah, I mean, so to me, like, it's, there's no different to someone from um, China coming and watching AFL game of football at the MCG. Yep. It has about the same relevance as me watching League of Legends. Yep. It's no different. So we got a, we 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 got a lot of work to do in that area, but I think we have the the tools and the strategy to to make really strong inroads. Yeah, I think I mean that was a point when I had uh, Nigel Smart from the Crows on. They were talking, you know, he was talking about the the audience extension piece that that, that diving into esports happens, and then you know you've got other pieces like uh, the foray into China and having games in China, both works in China to introduce to the market here, but it also introduces to the Asian market here in Australia to make them interested in football, potentially talking to their relatives about what this game is, as well as doing things like multicultural round where you've got multiple broadcasters or in different languages, uh, that kind of thing to uh, bring them into the fold to introduce them to footy. Yeah, I think it's about um, partly, and I think one of the strengths of AFLW um, was the storytelling that um, we were delivering branded content pieces rather than on-field content pieces, primarily because we had to because there was no on-field content. Yep, no, there was no content when the season started. So yep. you actually had to create uh, interesting, compelling storytelling. And I think that's one of the keys to sport is you have – so much ability to tell great stories and if you can tell great stories that resonate with people, you actually capture their imagination or you capture their interest and you go, oh, wow, what's this all about? And you only need to get a hook yep, and, and some thinking and do those sorts of things. So it's about how we tell great stories about the athletes, about the fans, about the administrators. What it is, there's always great stories. But I think the other piece of it is we've got so much good good stuff now that we're not amplifying. I'll, I'll give you a classic example. You know, I look at now kids, are, they're all on YouTube. Yep. One of our biggest and most successful programs is our footy card program. We don't have a YouTube channel for kids on unbox- unboxing footy cards. Yep. That's like, crazy. Like this is a massive program in Australia. It's still probably – and it's probably one of the most successful per capita head footy or card programs in the world. We have two, two programs in Australia that are, are world class and there is no digital content around those – physical card program that then supports it into a content piece into YouTube that actually helps kids buy more cards or understand the program. Yep. And Simple that, stuff. And, and that's sort of as the digital channels are evolving, right, because at the, you know, as you open up on all these channels, yes, the AFL will plant, uh, plant its flag on all the different platforms and then that channel becomes the channel everyone's pushing content through. But then when you say, well, we want to talk to the hardcore footy fan, but we also want to talk to the new – new fan that's, uh, you know, multicultural, that's new to the sport, but we also want to talk to, to women, we also want to talk to kids, those channels become very cluttered and, and how do you manage them and which lever do you pull? And that's when you can start looking at these different assets yeah. uh, for, for, for this bespoke type of purpose. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting, interesting challenge because not only – are there multiple channels now? So there's traditional media, there's linear TV, so that's, you know, free to air. You've got subscription television in Foxtel. You've got Over the Top with Netflix, et cetera. Uh, you've then got all of the social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter. You've got so many ways to reach your audience. The audience is uh, forever becoming more mobile, digital orientated. So how do you – and who would have thought that people would be spending, you know, 10 to 12 minutes of every game watching football live 
on a seven inch screen. Yep. On a you know on a Apple or Android mobile device in a restaurant. Like I, I, I couldn't think about that. Like that was unfathomable well, yeah, exactly. in two thousand and five. But even even three or four years ago, people yeah. were thinking, "Oh no, no, people won't do that. They'll they'll go to the screen." Yeah. But they do want to be engaged. And the other thing is, is the deeper they are engaged with their device and tune it in, it flows back. Like yeah. you, you then want to turn on the big screen yeah. TV. Or you want to so, sign up for the subscription. So one of the things that we have to do is, uh, and in today's world. You've got to go to your audience. You can't rely upon your audience coming to you with no trigger unless they're really avid fans and really diehard supporters who are seeking out information. But that's only a small percentage. The most of the people are living their lives. But I'll give you a question. The one thing that's just phenomenal is the is trade. Yep. Trade's off the ch- – I've never seen anything like it. And – you know, we work with Croc Media and Craig Hutchison on on that and his team and our team work really well in this whole trade piece. And in conjunction with Telstra also, we we decided, oh, let's let's create Super Trade Tuesday. Yep. Yeah, so I mean we I spoke to the, with Paul Marsh about this and for the, for the international listeners, it's a it's a two-week trade period. Um, at the end of the AFL season where all the clubs get together and it's when all the trades happen. So, you know, people have been talking about the NBA summer and how it extends because there's so many trades. This has been compacted into two weeks. Content-wise, there was, I think it was 11, uh, 11 hours of trade radio a day, yeah. uh, both live streaming from an audio point of view but more on the video side. Um, and, yeah, I caught up with uh, uh, Chappie and the guys at Croc Media last week and the numbers – were just phenomenal. People could not get enough of it. And, yeah, I did joke, you know, Super Tuesday was effectively a manufactured day like uh, oh, yeah. you know, Amazon's Black Friday. It's <laughs> like it's a day that you've got to tune in yeah. and there's no guarantee of any trades Nothing. happening. Nothing. So we, we, we were sitting, uh, Craig and I were sitting at the, uh, you know, as we were sort of winding up uh, on a Thursday or a Friday, I think we are just having a beer and we said, what about we create something? And Hachi's just a a content machine. He goes, yeah. why don't we create Super Trade Tuesday? And I'm like, oh, what are we going to do? So we decided to open up every channel, his channels, our channels, Facebook Live. We were going to stream from 7 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock at night. We were going to cut up every piece of content, feed it into Facebook Live, feed it into Facebook, feed it into Instagram, just put it as everywhere. Yeah. You know, I come back to my guys and someone said, what happens if there's no trades? I said, that's what trade period's about. There are no trades it's, until the last day. It's all about speculation. It's all, it's, it's all hearsay, right? And we just made it – and we made it up for the whole day. And the traffic doubled. It was off the charts. And the big, the big learning, no cannibalisation. Yeah. It just amplified everything because you were, you were finding the people in the channel that they wanted to consume in. And that was a really interesting piece. And people, you can never give them too much content because most of the time if you miss a piece of content, you're not going backwards. Yeah. You're not in rewind looking for anything. You just, you've got two minutes, you jump on, have a look, what's on, what's in my feed. Oh, here's a, here's a you know, two and a half minute clip on what Chad Corns or um, or Terry Wallace or Terry says Wallace about, is someone, saying about yep. this, right? So it's just like, oh, right, okay, I'll watch that. Oh, that was interesting. Bang. It was amazing. But this is where we've got to start to look at, you know, how do we find new audiences like that and how do we take our traditional view of digital media and rights and work with our rights holders to drive. So we created like the finals bot. Yep. You know, two years ago we would have never thought that we would be putting content on the Facebook Messenger yep. of video content on Facebook mini- Messenger, Messenger yep. and then drive it back to the traditional website. Unbelie- uh, unbelievable outcome. And I, I just read an article that tennis and kudos to those guys have actually driven 100, 170% more sales through their Facebook Messenger bot than directly with their ticketing agent. Yeah, a phenomenal and, outcome, and, and that's well the thing that, that that's evolving. Like you know, uh, we've done some stuff in the messenger bot space, and yeah, the engagement that the fans have in asking and getting, you know, getting because there's so much content that's sitting there passively on the websites so you can put into a bot, so they can just say, you know, 
uh, you know, what's the draft card for this player? And boom, it comes back. And then, oh, but if you want more, drive them back to the site. Um, but then you're seeing the advancements in the space. Um, PayPal, people will be able to send PayPal through the messenger bot. So things like, oh, yeah, I want to buy my membership or, or a ticket, that's not that far away. Yeah. And when we get into that transactional piece, um, it becomes, you know, gets you into that commercial space as well. Yeah, I, I think it, and then understanding not just where the audience is, but understanding the audience in a different way and data and insights and we're, we're about to, we're looking at what we do in this whole investment space as an industry with our clubs and, you know, we're, we're fortunate that we've got really good harmony within our clubs and within our playing group and we've got all of our deals away and now we have this really rare opportunity to invest for the next five years and where we really need to invest is to to digitally transform our business. We're still a traditional sports business yep. uh, primarily. We do... And, that, and there's nothing to dismiss that either. No, like, there's and, a, there's and we, that. Do a, we do a lot of things really well. Yep. But if we're going to continue to drive value, we have to maximise our existing value propositions and our existing operations and we have to better enable them digitally and then if we're going to create more value we actually have to use insight it has to be data driven and it has to be again digitally enabled from an investment point of view so they're big challenges and gee you talk to different people in this space and they could spend millions and millions of dollars and I know other sports are investing heavily in this space and you know we're we're on the same same journey, but in a lucky, I think in a in a really fortunate position to be able to to do that in conjunction with all of our stakeholders. Yeah, because oh, you because you have got that clear runway of the you know the CBA is locked in; those deals are in place. And the good thing about sport is you don't lack data. You've got all the data points there. It's a matter of solidifying a little bit and clarifying and then seeking out the opportunities and, and, you know, chasing them down, whether they be with a specific product like AFLW or, you know, it might be a specific digital ticketing hybrid product that gets people to the games, all of those kind of things. They're all the opportunities there, whereas, you know, traditional business doesn't have all of that data, all those data points immediately coming in because oh, you, you've got yeah. all the pieces of the puzzle here. You've just got to start deciphering it. We were talking about that in part of one of our review forums about building out this business case is we're sitting there and going our, our sport on the football side of things is so data driven so data rich and probably one of the most advanced technical data businesses in the world yeah you know, if you look at you know I, I bring people here from Gatorade and places and they look and they can't they can't believe, and the, yeah, the sports tech side of it, you know, the catapults tech, and that of the world, sport leading tech, the way, understanding all the data driven, how far, how fast, where they've gone, what they've done, load, etc. If we invested that amount of energy, time, and resource as what we do on field to off field, my God, we would transform our business beyond what we could even think about. We are so focused on being so successful on field that even if we invested 50% of that into our administration data and analytics side of our business, oh my God, we'd be flying. Yeah. You know, I just, I just, I just like, I, but that's the whole, that's the whole upside of, of your role because yeah. it, it's, there's all of these different up trajectories and it's a matter of which one uh, you chase down. Yeah, well, I've, been, I've spent, you know, in, in this role here and being within head office and sort of being within, you know, a really fortunate role, I've, I've probably spent 10 years of my of my sporting administration uh, trying to convince or influence or uh, lead or conjole or dictate sometimes yep. where – we need to be going commercially from yep. a club's perspective, a league's perspective, getting the right balance. How do we drive? How do we protect the? How do we protect our assets? How do we drive the assets? How do we do this collectively? So this is a game. We, we're 
done this before just in areas we've been much more comfortable in. Yep. So, again, it's, it's nothing new for us to explore a new opportunity as a collective. It's just a lot more challenging for us and we have to go and get the right capability, get the right people that understand it really well um, and, you know, who would have thought that we would be thinking about how do we employ data scientists from banks yep. to help us understand our business? Yep. Oh, well, the, the, I mean, the data side is fascinating, fascinating for mine and because it does – because you know, I've been in that same space. You know, started Sports Geek, said, hey, everybody, this is the space. We need to be in this space from a digital point of view. Mm. And it was a little bit of a leap of faith, but now the data's there, both with the data you've already got, but then also looking at what the NBA is doing, what the NFL is doing, what the MLB is doing, um, to say, well, that's, that, that's the path they've taken it's not as big a leap of faith as, as it was, you know, in previous years. No, and I think it's also been driven by partnerships and those who want to be involved in our game because, you know, gone are the days of doing a sponsorship deal over lunch. Mm. Um, you know, I, I remember, you know, 10 years ago I remembered, you know, You'd Shake, shaking a hand you because they're, a hand some, and, someone, they're, they're a supporter of the yeah, team. Or and, they love the game or, yeah. yeah, it's worked for us in the past, it's been really good, blah, blah, blah. Now you've got, you've got third-party groups that, you know, are doing analysts for brands and it's a much more competitive landscape. You know, we, we bring in AFLW, there's Big Bash, there's, uh, you know, different sports are getting much, much more uh, sophisticated in their sponsorship props and their, and their eyeballs through digital monetization. Yep. So it's a much, much more competitive landscape and the brands want ROI and they want to be able to see that their money that they're investing in sponsorship versus leverage is actually working for them. And if it's not working for them, they'll pull their money yep. because it is much more expensive for a brand to get to their customer today than ever before. Yeah, completely. Because of the fragmentation, because of if you want to actually be compelling in the social space, you've got to make good content. You and that's and that's why they come to, to a product like the AFL, to a brand like correct. the AFL because it's really hard for – you know, a bank or a telco or to produce that content and have a really strong connection with their fans. Yeah, and I look and, you know, NAB do that really well. Like not, you know, this is not a commercial spot, but they've leveraged that really well right through the pathway from Auskick all the way through to the elite part of the game. And what they came up with with many legends yep. was a complete authentic connection between Auskick, the elite pathway and they have spent, you know, over a decade uh, aligning themselves with the code. Yep. So it now makes sense. It's an so that's in its uh, for those. It's, it's in its second year. Yeah, second year. So and for I'm those who are uh, listening, uh, Nab did uh, mini legends where they get uh, uh, kid kid lookalikes, effectively of the of the biggest AFL stars in in a commercial. And it's you're right. It's it, like the launch this year, everyone was tuning in for it to see. Uh, there was strong connection with the players, you know, with uh, you know little Eddie Betts and mm. and uh, um, little Gaz and all of that. Um, it, uh, I think it Mo you know, Hope, yeah, Mo Hope as well. Um, you know, and I think it did a great you know great way for the to, to make that connection again. It goes back to your point before of connecting with those five to twelve year olds as to say, oh, how cool is this ad? Connects them with the AFL, and it's a you know. It's a far more integrated, bigger approach than just the can we put the logo yeah. you know, on the side of the on the side of the stadium. Yeah. And most of the brands we work with in Australia, they don't they don't need um, awareness. Yeah, everyone knows who Toyota is. Everyone knows who Nab is. Everyone knows who McDonald's is. Everyone knows who Virgin is. Like, yep. everyone knows who CUB is. Like, they don't need brand awareness. They need, in most cases, consideration. Emotional connection, validity, and footfall, and those things. If you can't demonstrate that you are providing that, I was having this conversation with some of my commercial team yesterday about we are just a conduit between the brand. So the commercial team, we don't put the game on. Yep, we just provide the right assets, channels, and opportunity through 
what I sort of draw from them is, is we're just a big pipe. Yep. The brand sits on one end, the customers or our fans sit on the other end, and in between there's a whole lot of ways for that brand to interact with these fans and these fans to understand and consider this brand. Make it as frictionless as possible but aligned to the objectives of the brand. And if we're not aligning the brand objectives now of the sponsor and delivering, I tell you what, there's organisations out there that will tell them where there is better value. Yep. And that's what, you know, if anyone who's working in this space knows, uh, it is an ever-increasingly difficult environment. Um, Brands don't have the same amount of money and they are switching from sponsorship to leverage. Yep. Or media. We're fortunate that we've built both. That's a really good... Um, it was a good strategy that we started five or six years ago to not only are we a sponsorship property but we are also a media business plus we're involved in signage and LED and we've got a print, you know, in terms of the record. So we have uh, a number of pieces of the pie for a leverage budget around their sponsorship. Yep. Well, last thing I wanted to ask because growth and audience is a big part of your role. Uh, and we've got international listeners. So how can how can international listeners, people in the US or Europe, how can they consume the AFL and how is that product developing over the years? Yeah, look, we've got a, a, a really strong uh, international digital pass that's available and we've got, you know, Australians travel, we've got a huge number of expats all over the, over the world that consume the content the other thing too is that we have a lot of international students that come here live here for four or five six years go home and still actually have have, have got a love, love with fall the in love with the game and they consume it through that digital pass um so you know that continues to grow at double digit sort of um growth rates it's not a small base but we're still pretty happy with how that that goes but can consume it anywhere um I think the other part of it is we need to be starting to make, um, you know, a more of a red zone sort of product, yep. which is much more uh, consumable, uh, much more, you know, you know snackable um, package, but also explains the game a bit better. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to, uh, I guess, the developments when speaking to Chris Wagner from New Line around what they've done in the NBA in creating those quick turnaround games and the shorter highlights that they're finding, you know, with so many games the NBA play that people do want to watch that six to 12-minute recap of the whole game and get all get all the highlights, that becomes more consumable in the, you know, in the international market that someone doesn't want to sit down for the two hours and then, you know, that gives them that taste and then potentially they get onto that onto that product and grows, grows the brand and grows the sport potentially internationally. Yeah, I think that's – well, that's – that's the same domestically. Yeah. Uh, so it shouldn't be any different internationally. But I think the other piece of the puzzle for us is how do we partner with some of the bigger sporting codes? And because it, it you know it sort of runs really nicely for us with the NBA and NFL. Yep. Off season, on season, and you know, with the advent of um, the digital passes and the time zone differences, um, not only. Are we competing with rugby league and uh, soccer or football and cricket? We're competing now with the NBA and the NFL in this Completely. marketplace. You know, it's, the NBA is probably one of the fastest growing consumable sports in this country. So, you know, we, we need to – you can't beat them because they're pretty big. Yep. You might as well try and join them and that could have some benefit for us internationally. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming on the show. Where can people find find you on the internet or where should uh, people look to connect with you? Uh, they can find me on LinkedIn. I, I probably need to, now that I'm in the digital space, I probably need to update my <laughs> LinkedIn profile. Um, I tend to not be on social media all that much. Um, I think my that's probably advice from the public affairs people. But, yep. um, oh, look... You can just find me you know, generally at www.afl.com.au pretty and much. And to, to finish with my uh, closing five, do you remember your first uh, sports event you ever went to? A uh, major sports event. I grew up in a small country town and every year we would get on a bus and come down to the MCG 
And I, the first game I think I can really remember on that bus trip was Geelong versus Richmond and Gary Ablett kicked 14 goals. That's not a bad uh, first oh, game. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, Gary awesome. Ablett, uh, son of Gary Ablett Jr. and known as one of the, if not the best, it's obviously argued that uh, yeah. either one of them is one of the best players ever to play, so that's not a bad first game. Um, do you have a uh, – you would have been a few sporting events in your role over the years. Do you either have a fa- favourite food memory or do you have a go-to food when you go to a sports event? Uh, is beer a food? <laughs> <laughs> it is when I go to the footy. Uh, so, yes, beer. It's the first time everyone just named, named it liquid as their main. Uh, yeah, well, it. But, I've, uh, I've been to a number of sporting events and it seems to be the staple. It, it is It is very much the staple of every uh, sports event. Um, what's, the, what's the first app you open on your phone in the morning? Oh, I think it would have to be. Oh, I'd be silly not to say AFL Live. Um, <laughs> but it's, no, it's probably not that. It's probably my uh, email. Email, check check what's happened overnight. Yeah, that or um, – yeah, no, that, that'd, be the, that'd be the two. Yeah. And uh, is there someone that you suggest that you follow to keep up with everything, whether it be uh, a magazine or, or a blog or something that you suggest people should be uh, following? Not really. Like, not really. I um, – Oh, you should be following Sports Geek. That <laughs> that, that wasn't that, a, that wasn't a long ball. There, that's, a, that's a that's a given because the the aggregation all that information I find really beneficial. But my my suggestion is um, outside of sport. Yep, I spend a fair bit of time just reading. And I'm not a big reader of books, but I consume a lot of content, and it's usually outside of sport. It's like what can you learn. From outside of, so in the, the entertainment music. industry, yeah. what how oh, how any, movies are being promoted, all of anywhere, that kind of, like yeah. it's just like oh okay, what what's this? What are these people doing around uh, leadership? What are these people doing around you know people? Because at the end of the day, even though we're in a sports business, everything's about people. Yep, you got to have good people, got to have good structures, you know. And, and I'm really lucky. I work with some really great people. Uh, last question, um, Kevin Durant style, where he where he named his uh, real MVP. Uh, what social media platform would you bestow the honour of uh, the MVP? Right now, you can't really go past Facebook. Yeah, they, yeah, their their innovation, their segmentation, the ability to get return on investment when you invest in Facebook is um, beyond every other um, channel that we've explored. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is the, the, the innovation they're putting in the, in the ad product is that's where it's, it's – Yeah, look, we, we, we for the first time last year partnered with the clubs and did a whole heap of stuff in Facebook around ticket sales, yep. tried a whole lot of different things. And really with the, you know, Karen uh, from Facebook just, has been a massive supporter of ours and really helped us and delivered some really great insight. And we had a one to, I think a twenty five percent, you know, one to twenty five ratio return on investment. Yeah. And you know, we we sold probably over three, nearly close to four million dollars worth of tickets last year through Facebook. Yeah. And you measure every purchase. Yeah. And that's yeah, that's the advan- uh, the advantage of it. Uh, uh, completely agree. Thank you very much for coming to the podcast, and all the best uh, for next season, uh, which uh, AFLW coming up in January. Yeah, well, it's only yeah, not far away now. Exactly, it's a tw- twelve month a year sport now. It, it is. Thanks, Darren. Hey, thanks, Sean. Download our latest guide on Facebook audiences at sportsgeekhq.com slash fb data. Thanks again to Darren Birch, uh, also known as Birchy in uh, the AFL football circles. Um, it was good to everyone catch up with him when we had this chat and then followed up uh, at the AFL Summit uh, where they brought the clubs in and uh, started to discuss their plans uh, for, uh, for 2018 and beyond. Um, and yeah, Birchy got up and, and spoke a lot about the stuff that we discussed in the in in our chat around around data and attracting new fans and uh, and and tackling where 
where there's opportunity for new fans and then also establishing and doubling down where they are do have a stronghold. So it was good to catch up with a few of the clubs uh, that were in attendance and also see uh, uh, Priya uh, from Yin's Cam, who's uh, been a previous guest, as they, they do the uh, uh, the club uh, apps in, in AFL land. land. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting uh, next couple of years for, for the AFL and the clubs as they further develop their uh, digital offering to, to fans and really putting uh, what, really putting the fan at the centre. Um, and that pretty much came from Gil McLaughlin's uh, opening speech of the summit. Uh, it's, all about the, it's all about the fans and making sure uh, they are at the, the centre of it. So... The, the thing for mine, um, and it's not uh, it's not an AFL specific thing. But it's something that uh, has worked in sort of both sides of the landscape in club land and understanding what the teams uh, are doing, um, and also at the league point of view in, in doing some stuff at, at league level and knowing that it's a it's a different objective and a different uh, set of circumstances and different challenges. Um, so it's some, it's it's a little bit uh, like I've said before that digital divorce counselor. I sort of understand both sides, uh, the club point of view and the and the league point of view, um, and so it's it's a matter of bringing you know those two in alignment. Um, and you know I do understand the the the, the challenges of, of delivering technology and, and strategy to a for, for a league wide thing. Um, I was talking to the. Uh, uh, to the to the team at Telstra that do a lot of the infrastructure uh, in their partnership with the with the AFL and uh, I sort of described it as uh, trying to drive a, a stagecoach uh, with eighteen horses uh, and so some are pulling in the right way and some are pulling in different ways and so it's a very hard thing to manage uh, that that league approach and as I said this is not a this is not an AFL uh, specific uh, commentary because it's it's common across uh, a bunch of leagues when you talk to people who work in uh, headquarters um, for for a league and and what their objectives are and then trying to align them with uh, with club object objectives um, it's always it's always a challenge um, but uh, I think it's uh, something you got to keep got to keep aspiring to um, and I can, and one thing I want to do is sort of follow up and sort of speaking of Darren's and trying to put in a, a smooth segue uh, there was uh, Darren Ravel uh, well known sports biz tweeter it works at ESPN. Um, made the news here in Australia uh, for his, uh, I, it, I'm not going to understate it, his horrific attempt of eating a 4 and 20 meat pie. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who are listeners to the podcast regularly, I've been doing the closing five uh, quite often uh, now in the, in the last past year. And one of the things is, uh, what is the favourite food you eat uh, at a sporting event? And Quite often, a lot of the Australian uh, guests, and myself included, would say, uh, yeah, meat pie with sauce or ketchup for my US friends. And uh, you just simply eat it with your hands, Darren, uh, not with a knife and fork. So in the video of Darren Ravel trying to eat a pie, a meat pie with a knife and fork, um, uh, the trend, the trending hashtag was teach Darren. So uh, uh, quite quite funny and, you know, an innovative way for the... For four and twenty to to get uh, into the U.S. market, uh, uh, partnering uh, with uh, the Philadelphia 76ers with Ben Simmons, uh, Aussie number one pick that is tearing up the NBA. So it'll be interesting to see. I was tempted to to uh, offer a, a live video to show Darren how to eat a meat pie, but uh, I might might wait that for the uh, start of the AFL season. So one of the things I did want to wrap up with. Um, it's been a big week. It's been an early morning week here at uh, Sports Geek. If, you have, if you've been following my Instagrams and a few of my posts over the over the week, you have seen that we've been part of uh, a, a Kickstarter launch, um, the launch of Super Bulbs. It's a smart device for football fans uh, and it, uh, it's a Wi-Fi connected light and speaker that is connected to the stats feed. As you're watching a uh, college football game, um, it will be connected You'll say, I'm watching Alabama or Tennessee or Michigan State. And then when the quarterback goes back into the pocket, throws the, throws the rocket pass into the end zone, uh, the light, the Super Bowl, will light up in celebration mode. Uh, and so it's really exciting. It's looking to bring that stadium experience that we now all know um, around, uh, around sounds, LED and all of that kind of thing to build out the, the stadium experience to try to bring some of that back into the home so working with the guys at Creator Sport uh, to to launch this uh, 
We launched it, uh, we had to launch it at 4am in the morning in Melbourne time to uh, sort of, uh, it was uh, 12 o'clock uh, in New York, so we wanted to get to the eastern uh, eastern US uh, to uh, upon launch. Um, and so, yeah, so the, that first day, um, one, it was a, a whirlwind uh, behind the scenes we uh, launched it uh, on Kickstarter at 4am we sent out the email to the list that we'd built up in the previous uh, three weeks um, we did a couple of Facebook lives and Kickstarter lives and we achieved 15% of, of funding uh, for day one so I'd really love your feedback um, as you listening are in the sports space I think the Super Bulbs has got got some real uh, validity uh, as a fan engagement tool in the home, it effectively will give teams a means to engage with fans in the home. Um, you know, engage that 99%, if you will, or that are not attending the game, that are potentially watching it at home. So, you know, the the ability for for the club to be sending messages effectively, it's a it's a smart device uh, that that the teams will be able to send messages and curate uh, experiences at the home. So if you're doing something with your LED lights in stadium, that experience can be can be duplicated back uh, in the home. So it's early days yet. Uh, we've just started. It's going to run uh, up until Christmas. So you can go to sportsgeekhq.com slash superbulbs to check it out. Um, if you've got any questions, please uh, send me an email, sean at sportsgeekhq.com. At the moment, it's a it's a it's going to be working out of the box uh, once the Kickstarter is finished and be ready for next year's college season. Uh, the guys behind it at Creator Sport have done this before; um, they've done it with uh, big brands, so they, there's no problems there from a delivery point of view. So, um, and then the next uh, the next part of the equation is to talk to talk to teams around around licensing uh, and putting official markings and logos on the on the device as well and and developing a partnership on on that side so if you're uh, looking to uh, better engage your fans at home and uh, you're interested in the product uh, yeah please uh, send me a line I'm happy to connect you with uh, the guys from creator and then once once things have settled down uh, and the project is underway, I'm actually going to sit down with uh, Trav and Slade and Doug and, and sort of break down the behind the scenes of a Kickstarter campaign as well as, you know, the, their process of building out this kind of uh, future of fan cave products is what they're calling it uh, uh, in that internet of things, connected devices. So it's been an interesting project so, so far, real roller coaster. Um, but I would love your feedback. So either just go to uh, sportsgeekhq.com slash superbulbs and that will send you to the Kickstarter or you can just search for superbulbs on Kickstarter. And uh, yeah, you can buy one and have it fire off when your uh, college team uh, scores next next year. Until next episode, my name is Sean Callanan and you've been listening to Sports Geek. Join over 1,000 sports business executives in Sports Biz Slack. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash slack. Please share your fave episodes of Sports Geek on LinkedIn. Be sure to tag Sean Callanan. Go to sportsgeekhq.com for more sports digital marketing resources. Want to chat with Sean? Book a time for a call. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash phone call.